So we're reading from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Leela, the Lord, the Lord's attempt to go to Vrindavan, and we're doing texts two hundred and six and two hundred and seven. <laughs> And definitely not going to be reading all the Sanskrit in this purport. <laughs> if there's any Sanskrit experts, they can kind of jump in at the right time. Excuse me, my ears are blocked. Uh, okay, so 206. Tahan hoiti age gela shivananda kara vasudeva grihe pache aila aila ishwara. From the house of Srivas Thakur, the Lord went to the house of Shivananda Sain, and then to the house of Vasudev Dutt. So 207, text 207, so we can uh, we can repeat the Bengali for this one. Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila, Vachas, Vachas Pati Grihe Prabhu, Yemate Rahila. Vachas Pati Grihe Prabhu, Yemate Rahila. Loka Bida, Bhaye, Yaiche, Kulia, Aila, Loka Bida, Bhaye, Yaiche, Kulia, Aila. Loka Bida, Bhaye, Yaiche, Kulia, Aila. Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila Loka Bida Baye Yaiche Kulia Aila Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila Loka Bida Baye Yaiche Kulia Aila Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila Loka Bida Baye Yaiche Kulia Aila Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila Loka Bida Baye Yaiche Kulia Aila Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila Loka Bida Baye Yaiche Kulia Aila Vachaspati Grihe Prabhu Yemate Rahila
which was near Koladweep or Kulia. It was here that Devananda Pandit was residing. This information is found in the Chaitanya Bhagavat Madhya Kanda chapter 21. In the Chaitanya Chandra Dayanataka, the following statement is given about Kulia. Tata Kumara Hate Srivasa Pandit Vatyam Abhyayayo. From there, the Lord went to the house of Srivas Pandit in Kumara Hatta. There's a long Sanskrit sloke here, which I, I don't know how to pronounce. From the house of Srivas Acharya, the Lord went to the house of Advaita Acharya, where he was offered obeisances by Haridas Thakur. The Lord then took a boat to the other side of Navadweep to a place called Kulia, where he stayed seven days at the house of Madhava Das. He then proceeded along the banks of the Ganges. In the Chaitanya Charita Mahakavya, it is stated, the Lord went to the eastern side of the Ganges at Navadweep, and everyone was pleased to see the Lord coming. In the Chaitanya Bhagavat, Anchakanda chapter 3, it is stated, Sarva Parishada Sange Sri Gora Sundar. Achambite Asi Uttarila Tanragara. The Lord suddenly came to Vidyanagara with a full party and stayed there in the house of Vidya Vachaspati. Navadvipadi Sava DK Hoyle Dhwani. Thus, throughout Navadweep, the Lord's arrival was made known. Vachaspati Gari Aila Nyasi Chudamani. Thus, the chief of all the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu stayed at Vidya Vachaspati's house. Many hundreds of thousands of people went to see him and chant the holy name of Hari. It was so crowded that people could not even find a place to walk. Therefore, they made room by clearing out the jungles near the village. Many roads were automatically excavated and many people also came by boat to see the Lord. So many came that it was difficult for the boatmen to get them across the river. When Vidya Vachaspati suddenly arrived, he made arrangements for many boats to receive those people, but the people would not wait for the boats. Somehow or other, they crossed the river and hurried towards the house of Vidya Vachaspati. Due to this great crowd, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu secretly went to Kuliya Nagara. After the Lord left Vidya Nagara, however, all the people heard news of his leaving. They then accompanied Vachaspati to Kuliya Nagara. Since the news of the Lord's arrival was immediately broadcast, large crowds arrived and greeted Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with great jubilation. Indeed, when the crowd went to see Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it increased 10,000 times in number. No one could say how many people crossed the river to see him, but many hundreds of thousands made a great tumult when crossing the river Ganges. After crossing the river, everyone began to embrace one another because they heard the good news of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's arrival. Thus, all the inhabitants of Kulia, the sinful, intermediate, and spiritually advanced, were delivered and glorified by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. As stated in the Chaitanya Bhagava and Chikanda chapter 6, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu passed through Kanayoda, Badagachi, and Dogachiya, and then crossed the Ganges before arriving in Kulia. As stated in the Chaitanya Mangala, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu walked through Radhadesh and gradually arrived at the Ganges. After bathing in the river, he crossed it and went to Kulia. Because he had promised his mother he would return to Navadweep, he went to Varakona Ghat, a village near her house. In the commentary of Premadas, it is said, Nadiara Majhakane Sakala Lokete, Jani Kulia. Pahadapura Namistana. Everyone knows that in the middle of Nadia is a village named Kulia Pahadapura. Sri Narahari Chakravati or Ganeshamdas has written in his Bhakti Ratnakar Kulia Pahadapura Deka Srinivas Purve Kola Dwipa Pava Takya E Prachara. He said, O oh, Srinivas, just see the town of Kulia Pata. Patadapura, which was previously known as Koladweep. In a book named Navadweep Parakram, also written by Ganesham Das, it is stated, 
Kulia Padapura Grama Purve Koladwipa Paravata Kyanandanam, the town of Kulia Patapur Patad, sorry, Pahadapura was previously named Kola Dweep. Sorry, I'm really getting tongue tied with this purple. Was previously named Kola Dweep Parvatakyananda. Hare Krishna. Therefore, one can conclude that the present day city of Navadweep and the place is known as Bahir Dweep, Kolera Ganja, Kola Amada, Kolera Daha. Gara Kali, etc., were known as Kulia, but the so called Kuliara Pata is not the original Kulia. Oof, I need a drink now, <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> and that was missing out half of the purple. <laughs> it was a, a big, 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 big chunk of uh, probably Bengali, but I missed out. Om Ajnana Timiranda Syagananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapatam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padam Tikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagujatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Padajana Sahitam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Ladita Shri Vishakam Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swaman Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharini Nia Vishesha Sanyavadi Pastija Deshatarani Pancha Kalpa Tarubias Chakri Pasandu Bevacha Patitanam Pavanebio Vaishnavebio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, from the house of Srivas Thakur, the Lord went to the house of Shivananda Sena and then to the house of Vasudev Datta. So, um, sure, there's a lot that could be said. Uh, when I when I read this purport last night. Uh, my first impression was that I really wasn't sure what to say, you know, but, uh, but actually uh, one, well, a few things struck me. Uh, one of them is that, um, you know, there's all these different accounts given by different devotees who were obviously either present at the time that this past time was taking place or they are, um, kind of recollecting what was repeated to them by devotees who were there. And then Prabhupada's quoting from, well, obviously, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Jandradaya Natika, Chaitanya Bhagavat. Um, he also mentions uh, Chaitanya Charita Mahakavya. So there's at least four different books which are describing basically the same pastime. And in one sense, you know, okay, Lord Chaitanya went to this place, then he went to this place, then he went to that place. For, you know, from a, mundane, uh, from a mundane point of view, it could be questioned, well, is there, is there any need for so much detail? Is there any need for just this very kind of basic information to be repeated in so many different ways by so many different people in so many books? It, it doesn't appear to be the most important information at face value you know it's quite a, a sort of it, it we could be mistaken for thinking that it's a fairly sort of um not yeah like a fairly incidental occurrence that lord chaitanya from this house went to that house basically that's what's happening here he, he went to this house and then he went to that house <laughs> you know so why so much detail why so information and one of the clues is that, uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada's purports themselves, Prabhupada explained that his purports are his personal ecstasies. This is not just some academic exercise. Like I was listening um, 
I was listening to a, a class. It was, I was listening to a class by my guru, Maharaj Shiv Ram Swami, but I've heard of a number of devotees make this point before, no, most notably uh, His Grace Gopi Paranadam Prabhu, who kind of followed in Srila Prabhupada's footsteps in, in um, translating uh, a number of our uh, most prominent Shastras before he tragically left us a few years ago. And, um, you know, he gave us the... Uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Sri Krishna Lila Stava, the um, uh, Tattva Sandhava, um, and the Lagu Bhagavatam Rita. At least those four books, maybe a fifth one as well, but at least those four books that he left. And he he translated following in the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada. So the point he makes and the point that a number of devotees makes is that when Srila Prabhupada translates books like you know translates from sanskrit to english or bengali to english he doesn't just give a literal translation this is not just uh, speak into the microphone further closer is that okay um he doesn't just give a literal translation it's not just <clears throat> okay this is the literal academic translation of this verse from sanskrit into english but srila Prabhupada is translating for meaning he, he, he is a person who has unfathomably deep realization and understanding of what these verses are actually trying to communicate to us. And if we just stick to the literal academic translation of a verse, we will get a lot of very valuable information. And there are a lot of Shastras which have been translated into English which we have access to now, which we're very fortunate to have access to, and which um, we can get a lot of nectar from. But there's a lot of information which is also overlooked or lost by trying to deal with a very literal translation. Because within the Sanskrit, and not just within the Sanskrit language itself, but particularly within books like Srimad Bhagavatam, the books of the Acharyas, the Goswamis, Chaitanya Charitamrita, we're not just dealing with language, but we're dealing with emotion. We're dealing with prema. We're dealing with bhava. And the English expression is that it takes one to know one. So if we're not on that platform of prema or bhava, and we're reading the books of someone who is on that level, we're not necessarily going to catch every detail of what is that they're trying to communicate because there's a lot of it which is hidden there's there's a lot of information which is kind of hidden within the language which is accessible by one who is on that platform now Srila Prabhupada is someone who is on that platform Srila Prabhupada is <clears throat> I think this is one thing that most of us <laughs> should and probably can agree with is that Srila Prabhupada is not an ordinary personality, but he's a pure transcendentalist. He's a person on, you know, incredibly elevated levels of Krishna Prema. And when he reads the Srimad Bhagavatam, when he reads the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he doesn't just see words on a page, but he he he's feeling the, you know, the... The, the very, very deep levels of Krishna Prema that these Acharyas are communicating through their books. So when Prabhupada translates his books into English, he's not just giving an academic translation, but he's, he, as far as it's possible to do, which is, which, it, which is quite restricted in the English language. Like, for instance, Prabhupada says that there are certain words which can't be translated into English, and so we have to just make do with whatever is available to us. So words such as dharma, and uh, I'm sure there are many other words that, that come to mind, come to devotee's mind, that Prabhupada sort of makes the point that they can't be translated into English, so we have to do the best we can with what's available to us. So similarly, although Srila Prabhupada himself understands the depth of these works of the Acharyas, translating them into English, that's a whole other challenge entirely. But as far as possible, he is translating these verses not for academic translation, but for meaning. So sometimes when you read the word for word of Srila Prabhupada's verses, 
sometimes it's a little tricky to say, well, well, if that's what that word means, how does he come to this translation? You know, occasionally you'll even come across verses where n practically none of the words or very, very few of the words that are in the word for word actually turn up in the translation. Generally speaking, at least most of the words you can kind of figure out from the word for word, oh, that's how Prabhupada's coming to this conclusion. But occasionally it's like, well, you know, you read the verse and then you read the word for word and the two don't seem to correlate. And that's because Prabhupada is, he's, he's giving the deep, he, he's giving the purport of the verse within the verse itself. So that when we read the verse, we are, <coughs> he's communicating to us as far as is possible, the meaning of that verse. And similarly, Srila Prabhupada's purports, he's not just, you know, commenting on the previous Acharya's own commentaries. He is doing that. But as well as that, he's, he says himself that my purports are my personal ecstasies. You know, this is Srila Prabhupada's ecstasy as, he, as he's communicating his purports. And that's why you get, you know, different purports are in different moods. You know, like all of a sudden you'll come across a purport like this, where Prabhupada just suddenly just recites this huge string of Sanskrit or Bengali slokas. And then other places he'll give quite a simple, straightforward purport. And, and it's, it's just, you know, this is Prabhupada's ecstasy flowing as he's writing the books, as he's commenting, commenting on the books, his own spiritual emotions and ecstasies are flowing through the purports. And, and the nature of spiritual emotion is that it's not just a rigid, straight line. It's, it's a roller coaster of emotion, at least so we're told. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's even quite unpredictable. And so Prabhupada's purports can even be a little unpredictable at times, you know, and we see that a lot in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. All of a sudden, Prabhupada will just start giving all these, it, it, in some places, he says, oh, he'll, he'll comment on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's purport and he'll start describing, you know, if you go to this train station and then you, you walk 10 yards down the road, turn left, go up the road, and it's like, what's happening here? <laughs> you know? And um, one devotee, Dravida Prabhu, who's one of the um, kind of uh, chief editors who, who takes care of Srila Prabhupada's books in the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, he said, actually, if you actually try and follow some of these instructions, you're probably not going to, you probably won't get to the desired destination because over the years, you know, a lot of the topography and geography has changed with these places. But the, it's not, the point is, is that this is Prabhupada's ecstasy just flowing through the purports. And one of the, um, one of the sort of aspects of this spiritual nature, the spiritual ecstasy, is attention to detail. You can see in purports like this that there's this very intense attention to the detail of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's activities. You know, if we're not necessarily on that platform, we may question, well, is it so important to give so much information about a very incidental occurrence. Lord Chaitanya went from one house to another. And then there's all these different commentaries by different Acharyas explaining how he went from one place to another and all the, the details and so on. And, and if we're not necessarily on that platform, then we may not realize the significance of such an incidental occurrence. But for one who is on that platform, every single tiny little thing that that person does has intense meaning and intense purport. And we, we see even with um, Srila Prabhupada, you know, Prabhupada's disciples have just written so many books about the life of Srila Prabhupada. And many of those books overlap. You know, we, we, we can see that different devotees were there at the same time and they're documenting the same exact incident. But they'll tell they'll give different details and one of them it may be literally that they'll mention Prabhupada blinked his eye or Prabhupada his ex his he smiled at this moment or he you know touched his face in a particular way because for the devotees who were there at that time every single last tiny little detail of everything that Srila Prabhupada did and similarly for the devotees who witnessed Lord Chaitanya's activities every tiny little detail means so very very much you know, and, and it may not be that we can necessarily um, analyze what that particular detail means, 
But the point is, is that this is what has stayed within those devotees' minds. When they're recollecting, remembering Lord Chaitanya or remembering Srila Prabhupada, they're remembering very specific details and it means so much to them because it actually brings them back to that moment. As they're describing these details of Lord Chaitanya or as devotees are uh, describing the details of Srila Prabhupada, the details are the things which bring us back into that very moment. So attention to detail, it said, is one of the symptoms of devotion. And it's actually something that we should practice. It's something that we should actually be practicing. So just hands up, just quick question, hands up. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advantage with this one. But who can put the hand up and tell me what color are the deities wearing today? Most of you can. Okay, that's good. Who can remember what color the deities were wearing yesterday? Sorry, yeah. Uh, white. white, yeah, white. Lord Chaitanya is wearing white and silver with a red kind of uh, uh, braid. And then Lord Nichananda has an orange and blue braid. Who can remember what color the deities were wearing yesterday? Raghunath, can you? Anyone else? I'm at an advantage because I dressed them. <laughs> but you, what, what color were they wearing yesterday? Green, orange. Yeah. Yeah. So these things are very important. One of my, uh, I wasn't trying to catch you out and I'm confident that you, you know these things, but it's something to kind of, we can catch ourselves with. And even during the day, we can catch ourselves, remember the deities. Uh, one of my uh, dear friends and a dear friend of this Yatra, Gadruma Bihari Prabhu, he was telling me that when he was living in Soho Street Temple, um, he, every day, one of his services was that he would go and do, um, like contact Sankatan, he would be going to Indian people's homes uh, along with probably devotees like Shruti Dharma and Pranabandhu and devotees like this. And he was, they were going to different devotees' homes and trying to encourage these devotees to become life members or sign standing orders, you know, donating to the temples. And he said that every day before he went, he would stand before Radha London Ishwara and Jagannath Baladeva and Subhadra, but particularly Radha London Ishwara, he would stand before them and he would try and memorize every single last little detail that he could about Radha London Ishwara that day. He would, he would remember what kind of Tulsi leaves do they have on their feet? Is it leaves or is it manjaris? How many manjaris? How many leaves? What color jewelry are they wearing? What kind of rings are they wearing? What kind of necklaces are they wearing? As much detail as he possibly could, he would remember and he would try and create a, an impression within the mind of the deities on that particular day. And then as he was going about his service during the day, he would regularly stop and bring the deities back into his mind because everything's coming from Krishna. All success is coming from Krishna and his service was for Radha London Ishwara. So he wanted to uh, meditate upon those personalities whom he was serving or whom he was uh, uh, engaged in, in, in whose service he was engaged. So, you know, this, this is an important aspect of devotional service. I've been reading, um, <clears throat> um, well, actually listening to uh, those of you who know Ganesham Priya Prabhu, who's more well known as Jay Shetty. Uh, he's just released a really good book. You got it yet, Raghunath? It's really good. You read it yet? It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. So he's released this book, uh, Think Like a Monk. Uh, and he, it's, it's kind of aimed towards a mainstream audience, but it's very, very, you know, he's speaking about his, his experiences, particularly when he was living in Govardhan Eco Village in Mumbai and the lessons that he learned as a monk and how we can apply those lessons to our, to our lives and how they're very re relevant for all of us and how every one of us can learn to live and think like a monk, uh, regardless of what our external circumstances are. So he was describing one time he was walking with, uh, um, I think, Garanga Prabhu. And Garanga Prabhu gave him the instruction that, because every day, he said every single day they would go on a walk. It was a 15 or 20 minute walk. He doesn't give the details, but I get the impression it was kind of going to the temple or something like that. So it was like a walk that they went on every day. And he said one day they were given the instruction, try and find something today that you've never seen before. Because you're going on the same exact walk every single day. And it's, it's possible to, that things become so routine that we no longer notice what's going on around us. Unfortunately, that's very much the case, especially nowadays, because a lot of the time we're not even looking at what's around us because we're walking around the place looking at our phones, <laughs> which is such a shame. You know, we're missing out on all this 
wonderful uh, nature around us that we can learn from. But, um, you know, they were given the instruction, try and find something today that you've never seen. And then each of the devotees would say, oh, I've never noticed that flower before. I've never noticed that bush before. I've never noticed that rock before. And then every day they would do this. And it trained them to become more and more conscious and more and more aware of the details of everything that's going on around them. And then one day, um, Garanga Prabhu actually put something there. He, 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 got a, he, he, he said, okay, I've, I've changed something today. I want you to find what it is that I've changed. And then they looked around and then uh, Ganeshampriya eventually found a particular rock which he'd never noticed before. And it was quite a quite an interesting, quite unusual rock with an unusual shape and an unusual color. And then they realized, oh, this, this we've never seen this before. So in this way, you know, we can actually train ourselves to become more and more conscious and more and more aware of what is happening around us. Because Krishna, he's speaking to us, he's communicating to us through everything that's surrounding us. It's not, I remember once I was struggling, um, really, really struggling. And um, I was complaining to Prabhupada Pranaprabhu. I was out on Sankatan, we were in Edinburgh. And uh, I remember where we were standing. So there was at least some attention to detail there. And, um, and I was kind of complaining about, I was struggling in a particular way. And Prabhupada Prana said, you know, do you think that Krishna is just gonna burst through the pavement you know, pop up through the pavement and, and tell you everything that you need to know. It's That's not the way that Krishna communicates to us. That's not the way he necessarily speaks to us. Krishna speaks to us through his pictures, through the world around us. He speaks to us through nature. He speaks to us through what what comes our way in life through the ups and downs in life like um a few days ago my computer got water damaged and i went through several hours of complete and total despair thinking this is gonna and it is it's gonna cost hundreds of pounds to get repaired and um and then i was thinking at night you know i'm, I'm so i'm so i'm in so much anxiety about this that that i'm struggling to chant Hare krishna i'm struggling to remember krishna because all I can think about is how much it's going to cost to fix my computer. But one day I've got a computer up here that's going to break down and I've got a machine here that's going to fall apart. So if, if my computer falling apart prevents me from chanting Hare Krishna, what's going to happen <laughs> when the mind and the intelligence and the body start to fall apart? You know, if, if I'm so confused, if I'm so like devastated about a laptop <laughs> what to speak of when the body or the mind starts falling apart so i, I kind of I, I was reflecting okay this is actually krishna's helping me here he's trying to show me something so in this way krishna works through nature through the ups and downs in life he speaks to us through the devotees he speaks to us through non-devotees he speaks to us through the bus driver through the shopkeeper through the bully on the street you know for many devotees who've done sankatan you know, we, we can sometimes lose our patience or lose our temper on the street, even get into arguments with people. But if we're a little reflective, we can think, well, actually, Krishna's sending this person along to swear at me and be nasty to me because he wants me to become Trinada Pisa Nichina. He wants me to become more humble, more tolerant, more patient. And he's helping me. He's actually, he's, he's concerned that I don't have these qualities. And so because I don't have these qualities, I'm not necessarily experiencing the joy of Krishna consciousness. So out of concern and love, he's sending these ups and downs my way to help me, you know. So the more conscious and the more attentive we are to the world around us and to every little tiny detail of the world around us, and also the more conscious and attentive we are to the descriptions of Lord Chaitanya and Srila Prabhupada and Krishna. Like um, we were, uh, Javat Vasi Prabhu and, and myself, we were... Um, tending to the shalagram shilas a few weeks ago. And while we were, while we were oiling the shalagrams, we were listening to a recitation of Krishna book. And we were, we were kind of commenting and discussing how in the, in, in the, in the very famous chapters in Krishna book, very often it's the small details that go over our heads. And like, for instance, in the killing of Agasura, there's all this wonderful description of the cowherd boys and the, you know, the, the games that they would play. And, and then you have like in um, when Mother Yashoda sees the universal form of the Lord, there's a little point in that where it's describing how, you know, Krishna would grab hold of the tails of the calves and the calves would run off and drag them through the mud and the cow dung. And it's all these little sweet details 
you know, that's where the descriptions of Vrindavan are. You know, we, 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 you know, okay, Krishna's killing the demon, but in between all that, there's these very sweet one sentences or short paragraphs which describe the beauty of Vrindavan or the how the cowherd boys were dressed, or you know, before Krishna jumps in to fight with Kaliya, he tightens his belt cloth and kind of like a wrestler, you know. So all these little details, these are, you know, it's a bit, it's a funny, it's a funny expression because in English they say the devil is in the detail, <laughs> but actually it's not the devil that's in the detail, it's devotion that's in the detail. That by the more attentive we are to this, to these details, the more, the more our mind is going to become absorbed by Krishna consciousness. And it's kind of, I remember it's a mundane example and probably, and it's the type of example which I'm kind of a little notorious for giving. But I remember before I had any, uh, any idea of Krishna consciousness, I remember I was in a friend's house and actually this happened a couple of times. Uh, there were a couple of occasions when I would be with friends and we would be listening to some music. And one of my friends would point out, oh, listen just now to this note. And the guitarist would just do one note just out of a giant guitar solo, that one note had caught my friend's attention and, and that was his favorite note, <laughs> you know? So I was like, really? <laughs> but then after it was pointed out, every time I listened to the song, I couldn't help but spot that note. So with Krishna, with Krishna consciousness, this is what we want to do. We want to fill our minds and fill our consciousness up with the little tiny details, you know, memorize these little tiny details that actually work very hard to remember them and to memorize them and to recollect them and, you know, stand before the deity and look at every single piece of jewelry that they're wearing, all the different colors, all the different patterns of jewelry. Um, when I actually started learning to dress the deities, that was when I really started noticing how they were dressed because I was looking, how are different Pujaris doing it? <laughs> and I still do that now, you know, when Jagannath Priya or uh, Chandra Priya, when they dress Gauri Natai, I'm trying to get ideas, <laughs> you know, okay, how can I do that? And they say uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So I'm quite often I'll look at the way that one of the ladies is dressed today, the and then the next day I'll kind of try the same thing while it's fresh in my mind, you know. So, but these are the important things, the details, the details of devotional service and the details in Srila Prabhupada's books, the details in Krishna's pastimes, details in our, the details in our memories of devotees. You know, when we remember, when we go back over our life and we remember being with devotees, being with our spiritual master, being with those devotees who guided us, you know, we'll remember these little details. And these are the things that we'll remember at the time of leaving the body. These are the things that have, they've created like a samskar in our mind. Sometimes it's the tiniest little thing. Uh, the first ever Rathyatra I ever went to, um, Kripa Moya Prabhu was on stage and he was dancing and leading a kirtan. And just for a split second, it kind of caught my attention, the way that he was dancing. And, and I can still see in my mind, I can see the way that he was dancing at that tiny little moment. So somehow or other, these sometimes the most unexpected things create a samskara in the mind of the devotee. And these samskaras, these are the things that we're going to remember at the time of leaving the body. It's, it's the things that have created such an impression on the mind <clears throat> that years later we can remember the tiny little details. So what we want to do is create samskaras within our minds consciously as, as we're like Javit made a really nice point the other week when he was giving class, he was saying that we can look at the, the deities every single day, but especially on a day when something mm -hmm. happened on that particular day that was a very significant moment in your life. You know, maybe the day you got married, the day you got initiated, the day that you first met your guru, the day that something happened in the temple room. And on that day, what were the deities wearing on that day? You know, the, these are the moments that are, that are going to stick with us. So we want to try and create these samskaras because within our material minds, there are many samskaras from before our journeys in Krishna consciousness and maybe even some samskaras that we've created during our journey in Krishna consciousness, which are, are not the best samskaras. 
and the, these are things which kind of come back to haunt the mind because they've created such an intense impression on the mind that they still come back to this day. We can remember little details of non-Krishna conscious things in our lives. So the more positive Krishna conscious samskaras we create within the mind, the more likely it is that these are the things that we will remember at the time of leaving the body. So we want to be able to remember Vrindavan. We want to remember Krishna and Krishna's pastimes. We want to remember the deities. <clears throat> we want to remember things that we've read in Prabhupada's books, things that our spiritual master has spoken to us. You know, these are the details. These are the samskaras that we're trying to create within the mind. And then in this way, when the mind becomes filled up with these samskaras, just like clearly when you read this purport, clearly these little details were real samskaras on the minds of the devotees that were there. And, uh, and we also want to create these samskaras on our minds. So we can do that by consciously um, attending to the details of, of what is going on around us. And sometimes it can even be like seeing a rock on the road. But if that rock on the road reminds us of doing devotional service, reminds us of being with the devotees, reminds us of singing a song or, you know, whatever it takes to remind us of these things, that's a good thing. You know, so we'll, uh, it's 25 past. So we'll, are, there, are there any devotees watching online now? Okay. So if anyone is online who has any questions or any comments, um, then you can type those in just now. And while you're doing that, we can ask the devotees in the temple room if they have any, either any questions or any reflections or any comments on any of the things that we've discussed. If anyone has anything. Peter? Yeah, I thank you very much for this interesting uh, lecture. And I, I also had this impression first when I read something in Chaitanya Charamita that there are so many details and why are they are so important that, that they are mentioned, all these little details. And I, I also would say it's like um, to be aware of all these details to, to come in the present moment. To be able to, to see all these details and to, to be aware of all these details. And then I was uh, considering uh, how, how can I do it? And then I said, okay, we need to concentrate, we, we need to, yeah, just to be in the in a present moment to, to notice all these details. Right? Yeah. If we are somewhere else, we, we cannot notice all these little details. And uh, yeah, I found it a very nice. Uh, helpful uh, lecture to, to be more aware of the little details. Nice, thank you. And to, to get some benefit or, or some auspiciousness from all these little details. Yeah. Well, especially, you know, when we're in a place like here, it helps us to be more appreciative as well of the devotees because we see all these little, like, for instance, we see, you know, the, all the flower arrangements that are around the place. There's been no guests for months, but still someone's taken the time to look after all these flowers, make all these arrangements. Why? So that it's nice for us, so that it's nice for the deities. So we can see these things and we can appreciate, oh, who is it that did that? Which devotee did that? That was so nice of them to have made this nice arrangement to, to beautify Krishna's temple, you know? So we can become, when we're walking around, we see all the work that, that's done and all the little jobs that have been done. And then as we're seeing them, we can meditate. We can try to remind ourselves to meditate on, well, who did that? You know, how much time did it take them to do that? You know, that the, the, they've taken the time and the energy to do these nice things for Krishna, you know? So the more, the more, and it's kind of, it's a two way door. The more aware we are, like they say, mindfulness is a very big word nowadays, mindfulness, being conscious, being aware, being in the moment. So the more mindful we are of what's going on around us, the more mindful we're going to be, when we're chanting Krishna's names, but also the more attentive and the more mindful we are while we're chanting Krishna's names, this will help us to be more mindful and more attentive to how, what is Krishna saying to us? You know, what, how, what is Krishna trying to communicate to us through everything that's going on around us? So the more attentive we are to our, to the chanting of Krishna's names, the more receptive we're going to be to Krishna's speaking to us through the devotees, through the pictures, through nature, through life's up and downs. So the more attentive we are, the more we're going to hear Krishna. So thank you. Guru. 
So are there any uh, comments or are there any questions online? Okay. All right, well, we'll stop there. So thank you so much, Peruz. Thank you for uh, kindly tolerating me and uh, to be continued. So maybe, um, maybe either Felix or Peter, one of you could be responsible for making sure that the next volume of Srila Prabhupada and Lila Marita is uh, brought into the temple so that devotees can relish hearing, I think, Uniting Two Worlds. I think that's the next volume, volume six. So that's very nice. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Sri Sri Kodanitai Maya Pusha Shiki.